the biggest question of alchemy has always been how to create the Philosopher's Stone. Alchemists were searching day and night to find the formula to obtain unimaginable wealth and glory. Eventually, they found it, but it turned out to be a little bit different than they expected. Instead from lead to gold, it was from three surprising elements to gold. They didn't need spells and chants from dead languages. They needed psychology, chemistry and your memories. All the knowledge gathered by nutritionists, military researchers and Freudians that it would have been called alchemy and dark magic centuries ago. Each alchemist has a servant, a golem, who works to fulfill their master's desires. In this story, the golem obeyed them through food and advertising, and golem paid the final price. What if we said that this golem is you? You probably remember from school that different areas on our tongue are responsible for different tastes. The classical taste map. It was proved to be false. We taste all the different tastes with our whole tongue. These receptor cells do not exactly sense the taste, but rather the nutrients that the food contains. Scientists recognize five primary tastes. Sweet, salty, sour, bitter and umami. Scientists wanted to add fat to this list, but they discovered that our taste buds have receptors to identify taste and no such receptor has been found for fat. We cannot taste fat. But how does fat work in food and in our brain? Without fat, food would be different. Fat turns loaves of potatoes into crispy marvels, parched breads into silky loaves, from piece of minced meat into delicatessen. Moreover, fat increases the expiration time of the food. As a result, the food doesn't go to waste while sitting on the shelves of a grocery store. The first influential scientist who researched fat was Alina Zhezniak. She discovered that fat was mostly not about taste, but texture. And texture makes us eat as much as we can. And these textural attributes became known as the mouthfeel of fat. For example, Charles Spence received IG Nobel Nutrition Prize for electronically modifying the sound of a potato chip to make the person chewing the chip believe it to be crisper and fresher than it really is. In simple words, we like food that is crunchy in our mouth, and it is crunchy because it is fried in fat. He implemented this crunchy discovery into the food industry when he started working for PepsiCo, and his lab's work was founded by Unilever, which is responsible for production for such brands as Hellmann's, Knorr, Lipton, Lux, Magnum, and the list goes on. Let's return to Alina Zesniak's work. Her research was followed by another Polish scientist, Adam Drewnowski, who made outstanding discoveries. He discovered that there is no break point for fat, which means that our brain never gets tired of it and never gives the signal to stop eating it. He discovered that if you combine fat and sugar, they start working in synergy, and as a result, the food tastes better. And when we get a mixture of sugar and fat, we perceive the food as less fatty. Sugar hides fat. Candy bars provide you with lots of calories, and they are very sweet. But most of the calories come from hidden fat. These statements have a scientific foundation. Fat works because of the following things. 1. Fat coats the tongue to keep the taste buds from getting too large a hit of certain acids. 2. Fat stimulates the tongue 
and prolongs the tongue's absorption of more subtle and aromatic flavors. 3. Fat stimulates the reward center, which generates the feelings of pleasure. The human body has a nerve called the trigeminal, which is located behind the mouth close to the brain. It has tentacles that extract information from the lips, teeth, jaw and gums, and carries it to the brain. It differentiates between textures, therefore helps us appreciate the textures of crunchiness caused by fat, and we really love it. It is no secret that we love fat, but how did it become so popular in the first place? To answer this question, we need to go back in time to 1912 and speak about a 38-year-old cheese seller named James Lewis Cruft. He discovered how to prolong the life of cheese and became a millionaire. He had no normal training in food chemistry, and by the usual activity, he was a clerk in a grocery store. His idea was to find a way to prolong the life of cheddar, and he found it by mixing different cheeses in a copper kettle, while stirring the pot continuously, until the cheese had melted. He called it Croft Cheese. Because of this procedure, cheese increased lifespan and it became resistant to humidity compared to the cheese without the thermal procedure. The government of the United States didn't miss it and saw its potential. Soon, Kraft was selling large amounts of cheese to the government as soldiers' supply. He sold £6 million, which is 2,721,554 kilograms to the US government during the First World War. By the time of 1923, Croft's company had become the largest cheese manufacturer in the world. This is just the beginning of the story of how cheese and fat are connected. Since the 1930s, milk was perceived as a vital product in the United States, and the government acted in a way that changed not only the United States, but the whole world. Because of perceiving milk as a vital product, the US government started mass buying milk using the taxpayers' money. Companies producing milk didn't need to find customers to sell milk. There was just one customer, and it was the state. Milk production sounds not so impressive as gun, medical or other famous lobby, but still they are very, very influential. Milk Lobby created their own promoting campaign, Got Milk. I don't fight crime. What do you fight? Wheat bones. A never-ending supply of milk. And chocolate milk. Mm. Want strong bones? The calcium in milk helps make your bones strong. Which caused such big resonance in media and society with clips, references and parodies that it was not possible for us to understand what was promoted specifically and what was done because of popularity and hype. It is crucial that we understand that raw milk contains a lot of fat, which is usually separated to make skim milk, which started to be a new health trend at that time. But we have one problem. Cows can't produce skim milk. What should we do with all of that fat? Firstly, the government decided to just store it, which cost taxpayers $4 billion in 1981. The storage fees were running upwards of $1 million per day. At this moment, Kraft Corporation had already discovered how to make cheese in no time. Her traditional cheese was made in one and a half year, but the new process was done in just a few days. It was called Milk In, Cheese Out. This was the turning point in the food industry and in our lives. Cheese mostly contains fat, and our brain appreciates it. Food Corporation started adding cheese to numerous food products, where it had been absent before now had double, triple, quadruple cheese topping. It was increasing the effect that food does on our pleasure centre. Food corporations had transformed cheese from a dish that we eat separately at dinner or lunch into an ingredient. Finally, all the fat from storages found use and ended up in our body. Companies are always actively looking for new ways to make profit. Even with a huge amount of milk fat, you have a cheaper opportunity. Paul Sabatier was the pioneer who came up with such a way when he managed to create butter-like substance out of oil and hydrogen. 
This idea was improved by Wilhelm Normel, who was a German scientist that showed liquid oils could be hydrogenated to change the physical properties. This was the birth of trans fats. In simple words, trans fats are liquid oils that were in contact with hydrogen. As a result, they changed their condition from liquid, cis fat, to solid, trans fat. This product is sold in shops under the name margarine. Yes, trans fats are margarine. That's it. Food companies are trying to hide this fact by renaming products. You need to just remember. Trans fats are margarine. It is cheaper and easier to produce compared to milk fat. But at the same time, it is much more unhealthy. In the early 90s, it was pointed out by Harvard School of Public Health researchers that trans fats raise the risk of heart disease. It has also been pointed out by Walter Willett and Alberto Asherio in AM. J. Public Health Magazine in 1994 that in one year alone, trans fats caused the death of 30,000 people in the United States. This was the story of the first alchemist. The alchemist of fat made the first part of the transmutation spell in order to achieve wealth and glory. And the golem started to be corrupted. We started to be corrupted because they played not only with our body, but also with our mind. Besides the debatable but delicious ingredients, the food makers use some more techniques to entice the clients. For even famous great soda war between Coca-Cola and Pepsi, was described by the ex-PepsiCo CEO Roger Enrico in his biography with the next interesting definition. If the Coca-Cola company didn't exist, we'd pray for someone to invent it. He wrote in his 1986 autobiography, The Other Guy Blinked, you see when the public gets interested in the Pepsi-Coke competition, often Pepsi doesn't win at Coke's expense, and Coke doesn't win at Pepsi's. Everybody in the business wins. Consumer interest swells the market. The more fun we provide, the more people buy our products. All our products. This is an original and interesting way to provide fun and entertainment. But it is very expensive. The majority of the food industry companies use a much more affordable, but same efficient approach. They have their brand mascot. A brand mascot is the materialization of a brand's personality in the form of an animal or animated object figure, symbolic in nature, that stands as its spokesperson and representative. The main functions of the brand mascot are marketing and building an emotional connection with the consumers. The company's heroes can be divided into three groups, human mascot, object mascot, and animal mascot. Human and animal characters are usually used for creating trust and closeness between a company and a customer. Object mascots are for creating a simple and instant association. An analysis of over 1,150 mascots reveals that 21% of all mascots are human characters, which is the largest category. One of the first brand mascots was not invented but borrowed from the Bible. It was Elijah, a prophet from the Old Testament. His image and name used to promote and sell cornflakes. This image caused a big scandal in old-fashioned Europe, and the name was changed to Post Toasties. To avoid the same situation, the next brand mascots became totally fictional. Well-known examples for this kind of mascot, Betty Crocker, Burger King, Julius Pringles, and real-life persona, Colonel Sanders. Betty Crocker is a fictional woman that was born in 1921 for the promotion of the flower of the Washburn Crosby Company, which later became General Mills. This woman took the company's director's surname and a randomly chosen name. People say that Betty Crocker reflects the personality of a common American woman. Women needed a champion. Here were millions of them. 
staying at home alone, doing a job with children, cooking, cleaning on minimal budgets. They needed someone to remind them that they had value. Betty Crocker is not only a name on the flower package. This woman is endowed with appearance, voice and personal signature. Betty is the character in whom people trust. She offered pieces of advice on radio shows, signed letters and published her cookbook. The only thing that distinguishes this woman from common people is that she doesn't age and that is why she is always ready to help every housewife. To be modern, Betty Crocker created her website with different advice and delicious recipes. The love of the audience made Betty Crocker the second most popular woman in America after Eleanor Roosevelt in 1945. After Betty Crocker's successful example, other companies started to use the brand mascot approach. Burger King is the famous brand mascot of a fast food restaurant chain. This fictional character firstly appeared in 1955. He was introduced as a small king with Alan Swift's voice in children's advertising. Since 2006, the Burger King character is also available for video games. The king's appearance changed with time, and now it is a life-size smiling man with a crown and brown beard. That's right. The double sandwich. Wake up with the king. The KFC fast food restaurant chain is an example of a company that uses a real person as their brand mascot. The face on the Kentucky Fried Chicken logo is Harlan Sanders, who was a southern businessman who opened the first fried chicken restaurant. His appearance is well known for all fast food fans from 1952. The old man with white hair, white beard and black glasses. What's interesting is that in Kentucky you can earn the rank of colonel without being in the military. In Kentucky, the title Colonel holds an honorary purpose and has nothing to do with the military. This was the case with Mr. Sanders as well. Like the Burger King, Colonel Sanders became a video game character as well. Besides this, some drivers in the USA are equipped with GPS navigational systems voiced by Colonel Sanders. Turning to the second group of brand mascots, Object. The following example should be shown. Small, colourful chocolate candies. It's a perfect description for sweet food lovers. However, for the Mars company, these words became an inspiration to create animated candies that would promote one of their food products, the M&M's. The M&M spokes candies appeared in 1954 and it was not just one mascot. Mars created a team of five different colorful candies. Chocolate candies have over 10 million subscribers on Facebook. Moreover, they have their own world in London, where all the fans can buy different M&M branded things. Animal mascots are also very popular in the marketing world. The famous floppy-eared brown bunny firstly appeared in 1973 to sell chocolate milk. Before Nesquik, his name was Quickie. Modern Bunny has a stylish outfit and is still popular among children. Why do companies use animal and cartoon style mascots? The main reason is that brand mascots create attraction for children using emotional bond. Kids see different characters in cartoons, video games, on the internet, food packages and of course all these colourful images call their interest. Food industry companies know their first target audience and using brand mascots they can easily manipulate children's minds. These childhood emotional bonds can influence further eating behavior and preferences and they will rise as a perfect consumer. Our bodies have a huge flaw. We are hardwired to sugar. Our taste buds and brain go crazy when we eat it. We have about 10,000 taste buds in our mouth and every one of them has special receptors for sweetness. These receptors are connected with our brain's pleasure centers. As a result, we feel fantastic and energized. Sugar has captivated humans throughout history. Sugar, or how it was called before, sweet salt has been produced from sugar cane, which influenced slavery in the regions of the Caribbean Sea. In 1807, due to the British naval blockade, 
France lost access to sugar produced from sugar canes. They started producing sugar from sugar beet, on the order of Napoleon himself. Sugar has had a grasp over humans throughout history. In our time, we have a research center located in the United States, which researches smells, tastes, and sugar. The place is called Monell Center, which was established in 1968. In 2001, they discovered that there is a protein molecule in our taste buds called T1R3, which detects sugar. Robert McBride, an Australian psychologist, has said, Nutrition is not the foremost on people's mind when they choose their food. It is the taste, the flavor, the sensory satisfaction. For all ingredients in food and drink, there is an optimum concentration at which the sensory pleasure is maximal. This optimum concentration is called the bliss point. Children and adults have a different bliss point. For children, the bliss point is higher, which means that children can enjoy much sweeter food. According to July Menel from the Monel Research Center, there are three other aspects that make sugar attractive to children. Firstly, sugar, or sweet taste, indicates that the food is rich in energy, and as kids are growing fast, their bodies crave foods to provide quick fuel. Secondly, humans did not evolve in an environment that had plenty of sweet foods, and we get excited when we have the opportunity to eat it. Thirdly, sugar makes children feel good. It might work as an analgesic. It will reduce crying in a newborn baby. A young child can hold their hand in cold water longer if a sweet taste is in their mouth. Liquid sugars, as corn syrup in soft drinks, do not activate the nervous system which transforms these sugars into a Trojan horse in a way. Sadly, we still gain weight without even understanding it. The same effect works with artificial sweetness. We taste them, but our body doesn't receive anything and we start to eat more. To give more specific information, we will speak about Dr. Pepper, John Lennon, The Beach Boys, ZZ Top, Cher, and Hillary Clinton are considered as fans of Dr. Pepper. This drink was always in a stable third place after Coca-Cola and Pepsi. But in 2002, Dr. Pepper started losing this position in sales. Coca-Cola sold 90 million cases more than the previous year, for a total of 4.5 billion cases in the United States alone. Pepsi was up a little bit too, with its 3.2 billion cases. By contrast, Dr. Pepper was slumping, down 15 million cases to a total of 708 million. In 2004, Dr. Pepper decided to ask for help from the food industry legend Mr. Howard Moskowitz, a mathematician and experimental psychologist, the creator of the Bliss Point. Howard Moskowitz increases sales not by advertising campaigns or changing packaging, but by playing with the magical combination of salt, sugar and fat. He worked with PepsiCo, Kraft and General Foods. His goal in each case was to find the bliss point in their products to increase sales. He calls it optimization. In simple words, he adds as much salt, sugar and fat as possible to make food cheap, addictive and as tasty as possible. For Dr. Pepper, he created a new formula, which added vanilla and cherry taste to the drink. It was the birth of a new drink, Cherry Vanilla Dr. Pepper. The success was so huge that the parent company, Cadbury Schweppes, sold the brand in 2008 due to the increased price. Moskowitz began his path to mastering the bliss point magic in the town of Natick, where in 1969 the US Army hired him to work in its research labs to find a way to make soldiers eat more food provided by the army. Back in the day, the average expiration time for a soldier's meal was three years, and it wasn't tasty at all. Soldiers found them bland. He understood the sensory-specific satiety, which is a sensory hedonic phenomena that refers to the declining satisfaction generated by the consumption of a certain type of food, and the consequent renewal in appetite resulting from the exposure to a new flavor of food. In simple words, he made food that you can eat and not get tired of. Not only was sensory specific satiety helping the army's mass production of MREs, but it also became a guiding principle for the processed food industry. It could be said that all of food industry's key players, such as Coca-Cola, Frito-Lay and Kraft owed their success to Howard Moskowitz. This, however, was just the beginning. While investigating the power of sugar, he used the mathematical approach and created a graph that looked like an inverted U. 
or like a horseshoe. He wasn't the first person to discover it, but the first who made it financially profitable. The graph basically showed that our liking of food rose as the amount of sugar was increased, but only to a certain point. Surpassing this threshold, adding more sugar, was pointless and had a negative effect on the taste. Basically, when this happens, we have gone over the bliss point. In the 1980s, Moskowitz became the food industry star, but Moskowitz wasn't done yet. He made another contribution to the food industry and our lives. He was hired to save Maxwell House coffee brand, which couldn't keep up with another coffee brand, Folgers. Try Folgers, the mountain-grown coffee. Mountain-grown for better flavor. And there was nothing to do about it. Moskowitz put on his white gloves and started his show. He made various tests and observations and discovered that there is not one type of customer, but three. There are people who like mild roast, medium roast and strong roast. It was a groundbreaking observation, because it turned out that it wasn't just for coffee, but all kinds of different food products. Before Moskowitz's discovery, it was just one consumer for one product. It was about to change. Now which customer had their own product? Honey, you surprised me. Your coffee's terrific. No more complaints? Mm -mm. You can make coffee for all my barbecues. <laughs> It led to profit, success and obesity as well. People like food with aroma, taste, texture and appearance. Sugar could give everything. Moskowitz himself has said about his work. There's no moral issue for me, he said flatly. I did the best science I could. I was struggling to survive and didn't have the luxury of being a moral creature. As a researcher, I was ahead of my time and I had to take what I can get. Would I do it again? Yes, I would do it again. Did I do the right thing? If you were in my position, what would you have done? But what was the physical trigger of those events? As with the fat, it was again the US government. In 1971, Richard Nixon unpacked a dollar from precious metals, silver and gold. He eliminated the international gold standard and introduced the system of floating currency regimes that we use till this day. As neoclassical economists like to put it, fiat money is backed only by the public trust. What caused the change was the Vietnam War. Historians have said that Nixon didn't have a lot of choice because the war had been financed by deficit spending. The United States was suffering without money and without food. In 1971, not only the economical system changed, but eating habits changed as well. The Vietnam War was threatening Nixon's reputation as a president. And to regain the trust of the citizens, Nixon had to do something. He knew what to do. He appointed Earl Butz as the Secretary of Agriculture. Mr. Butz pushed farmers to grow one crop in particular. It was a perfect source for cheap food. It was corn. Cows that ate corn got bigger. Everything was fried in corn oil. Cereal, biscuits and flour were made out of corn. But the most crucial part came after. Butz visited Japan to look into a scientific innovation. Mass development of high fructose corn syrup. With the help of scientists like Moskowitz, Corn syrup pumped into the industry. As it is a liquid, as we mentioned, we cannot spot it. Now the Trojan horse has breached the city, but no one suspects a thing. It was the second part of the transmutation spell, which was casted by the sugar alchemist. The golem started to suffer even more. We started to suffer even more. Food memories are colourful and vivid. They sometimes feel more reminiscent than other types of memories because they involve all five senses. It can be a simple candy or fruit that our mother gave us after breakfast. Or it can be a food that recalls your first baking experience or your first cut or burn. Your birthday was celebrated in a fast food chain. Happy meal. Come on, I'll make one specially for you. Okay. Sweet water which you received from a school competition. All adults have a memory of a food that sends them back to childhood. Food memories feel so nostalgic because there's all this context of when you were preparing or eating this food. So the food becomes almost symbolic of other meaning. Researcher Whitburn says... A lot of our memories as children. It's not so much the apple pie, for example, but a whole experience of being a family, being nourished. And that acquires a lot of symbolism apart from the sensory quality. 
Brands understand it and use it as much as possible. Coca-Cola provides competitions for children. McDonald's supports children's initiative and charity for children. They do everything to create positive memories and nostalgia. Not with events, but with their food. Nostalgia is necessary to a human being for different reasons and functions. Scientists allocate three types of food nostalgia. Positive sweet, negative bitter, ambivalent bittersweet. The first group includes food products that recall positive emotional reactions, joy, peacefulness. The second one consists of negative memories, which can be described with regret, anger and sadness. The bittersweet group recalls both positive and negative emotions. Scientist Bergström told that taste memories tend to be the strongest of associative memories that you can make and explains that it's because of a survival tactic called conditioned taste aversion. Conditioned taste aversion is basically what happens when you get food poisoning and as a result develop an aversion to a dish, ingredient or an entire restaurant for a certain amount of time. Our senses and survival tactics aren't the only elements at play when it comes to food memories. The situation, where you were, who you were with, what the occasion was, adds the most power to our nostalgic taste memories. While I was purchasing a pack of biscuits, I stopped in front of the Lou strawberry cookies because these were what my mother used to give me for my tea. I felt both joy and yearning. You no longer find our childhood sweets, which makes me feel nostalgic. It was better before. Whenever I have some frozen moussaka, it always reminds me of the dish my mother and aunt used to cook, but it has nothing to do with theirs. I sadly miss the people who are no longer there. Food memories are not based on our needs. They are shaped by the context, the concrete company and concrete emotions. You associate brands with activities and events. So when you see another bag or bottle, you have strong emotions and memories. We associate Coca-Cola with joy, happiness and Christmas. Home, the magic of Disney and Coca-Cola classic. Red Bull with competition, adrenaline, danger and excitement. And Lay's with football competitions and party. Brands considered as nostalgic transcend time and place and provide a form of time travel. They reflect the values, beliefs and identity of the society in which they have developed. Some food product brands recall childhood and earliest memories. McDonald's's Happy Meal Box has been a long-standing tradition since 1979. With this video ad, the global fast food chain shows how this tradition was developing through the years. When you see any big brand name and you feel that it is more for you than food or water, probably you're already programmed by the corporation for one simple reason. It doesn't matter the quality or price, you will buy again. To remember your feelings, you do not pay attention to the price or quality, but you associate the product with previous experience. People love salt. Among the basic tastes, sweet, sour, bitter and salty. Salt is one of the hardest ones to live without. And it's no wonder. Salt or sodium chloride helps give foods their taste appeal. In everything from bacon, pizza, cheese and french fries to pickles, salad dressings, snack foods and baked goods. Why do we like salt? Compared with sugar and fat, we don't know. When we are making brain scanning and observing how sugar and fat interact with our brains, we see that they stimulate pleasure centers, a sexual activity or voluntary exercise. We like it. We love it. We want it. But about salt, we don't know exactly. One theory that is because human evolution started from the sea and why we are craving salt, like a distant memory from our ancestors. We taste it with all our mouth. Not with one part of the tongue, what you probably heard. But salt is the mineral dead and devoid of any sustenance. It does not have any calories as fat and sugar, but we cannot live without it. And our body also cannot live without it. When do we want to eat? When you want to eat, are you sure that you are really hungry? People are craving heavily sweet, fatty and salty products. Because we have a fear of getting hungry. The food industry knows it. Just remember the slogan for the Snickers candy bar. I am the horseless headsman. I think you mean the headless horseman. No. Have a Snickers. Why? Because you get confused when you're hungry. Better? Better. You're not you when you're hungry. 
When we speak about salt here, it's not only salt, but also sodium citrate, sodium phosphate, and sodium acid pyrophosphate. If we compare with fat and sugar, salt is the last pillar in the food industry, the last magic element to achieve a perfect food. What is the main reason why the food industry is totally dependent on salt? The answer is WOF, warm dough flavor, which is a disease and scourge of the processed food. It is caused by the oxidation of the fats in meat, which gives meat the taste of cardboard, or as some in the industry describe it, as the damp dog hair. People smell it and taste it, and salt is the only solution to fix it. Of course, not only this. Salt also delays the bacterial decay, binds ingredients and blends mixtures that otherwise come unglued, like the protein and fat molecules in processed cheese. Salt-making products look and taste attractive and last longer on the shelf. Moreover, all famous brands of processed food such as Oreo, Corn Flakes and Ritz Cracker, without salt they're impossible to eat. They have a taste of metal, they are ugly and nobody will buy them. Salt and salt elements are the real game changers for the food industry. Every year, the food industry uses around 2.2 billion kilos of salt. But is it really bad to consume salt? The problem is not the salt per se. The problem is sodium, which is one of the chemical elements in salt. It is necessary to have it in our body, but when we have a huge amount of it, it increases the blood pressure which leads to heart attacks and strokes. Unfortunately, the food industry puts in as much salt as possible. For example, in Finland in the 1970s, people consumed more than two teaspoons of salt per day. As a result, the country had an epidemic of heart attacks and strokes. Men in the eastern part of Finland had the highest rate of cardiovascular disease in the world. It was not genetic predisposition or biological difference. It was just a lot of salt in processed food from supermarkets. Finland started to attract attention to high salt consumption by marking high salt food with warning marks, high salt content, on the food products that are visible to everyone. As a result, they managed to decline the number of strokes and heart diseases. Nowadays, the World Health Organization declared that the normal salt consumption for an average human is less than 5 grams, or 1 teaspoon per day. And in addition to this, salt should be iodized. It was the last element to achieve the perfect food. Alchemists found a way to obtain it. It is not the end. Now we will explain who played with us and our minds. Did you know that the food industry has been under the control of the tobacco company for 22 years? Yes, you heard everything correctly. In the 80s to 90s, the tobacco and nicotine themes were very disputable, and people who said this... I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. ...decided to invest into the food one great cigarette producer, Altria, previously known as Philip Morris, famous for cigarettes as Marlboro, This is Marlboro Country. Chesterfield, Parliament, Virginia Slims, l &M, decided to play it safe and buy General Foods Company, famous for the brands Betty Crocker and Green Giant. It happened in 1985. In 1988, the tobacco company wanted to widen the food industry impact, and after negotiations, they were able to buy Kraft Foods, whose famous brands were Oreo, Milka and Philadelphia Cheese. Having had a tobacco company in management in the 90s, General Foods and Kraft Foods were not able to develop as well as they could if they would be independent companies. With an extraordinarily good taste and no unpleasant aftertaste. In 2007, Croft Foods were able to free itself from the shackles of nicotine and tobacco. After the split of Croft Foods, united with Haynes Company in 2015 and became the fifth biggest food industry company in the world. Meanwhile, Altria Group continued to produce tobacco products, but the company did not make any attempts to participate in the food industry. 
However, the impact of the tobacco company was so influential and strong that we live now in the post-tobacco food industry. Business Insider even has an article with the title The New Tobacco. That is why the quote, the nicotine is not addictive, can now be perceived in totally the same way as sugar, salt and fat are totally fine. Just remember, the cowboy Marlboro's actor died from lung cancer. But brand mascots can't die from diabetes can suffer from obesity, their hearts are always in perfect condition, because they are not real. When we are speaking about the food industry, we usually mention Kraft, Nestle, Coca-Cola or any other famous company. But who is the main supplier for the fat, salt and sugar? The three main alchemical components of delicious food which always looks beautiful and stays fresh on the supermarket shelves for months. The main supplier exists. It's called Cargill Incorporated. It started out as a farm company, but they don't farm anymore. They don't have land anymore. Their business is based on selling three pillars, fat, sugar and salt. Cargill is in the top 15 of highest revenue producing companies, right near the communication giant AT&T. Moreover, in 2019, Cargill is the number one in Forbes' list with a total $113.5 billion in revenue. What is interesting, you can't buy stocks of this company, and no one could buy them. This company is privately held, controlled by the descendants of a person who founded this company, William Wallace Cargill. Cargill is the largest private company in the United States. The Cargill family, or Cargill Macmillan, or how they were called by Forbes, the richest people you've never heard of was the fourth richest family in the USA by Forbes' list in 2016. The revenue was $49 billion in 2016 and $113 billion in 2019. Cargill Company is a cog and proxy in the whole food industry. They have 166,000 employees in 66 countries and at least 350 chartered cargo vessels. Probably whatever you eat or drink contains something from Cargill. Each day they produce almost 2 million kilograms of salt. And we don't even mention the production numbers for sugar and fat. The Cargill Macmillan family sold ingredients for the Bliss Point and became so rich that we cannot imagine. But a consumer pays the final price with their health and money, as usual. Now we have three elements of our alchemical transmutation spell. Fat, sugar and salt are working in a perfect synergy, making each other stronger and tastier. But maybe we need something else. Something which would help us to sell this food to the customer. And yes, we have it. We have this as a magic charm that resonates with our minds and forces us to go to the shop and forces us to make the first purchase. We have it because to be hooked on the food, firstly we need to buy it and taste it. If we trace the time and location when it started, it will be in Germany on 10th of May 1933. Exact place? Square of the State Opera, or how it was called by the Germans, Bebelplatz. At this place, date and time, Joseph Goebbels delivered his speech about intellectual filth and asked for the fire oath from young people and students. 40,000 people witnessed how the infamous Burning Books event started. This historical and political act is connected with our food industry in a strange and unbelievable chain of events. In the list of Burning Books were Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels as political enemies. Erich Maria Remarque was an enemy of the German national spirit. Surprisingly, under number four in the fire list was Sigmund Freud with an interesting description. He was considered a soul-tearing enemy of the humans. Sigmund Freud was a very popular and influential person at that time. His influence with psychoanalysis methods on psychology and psychiatry through academia and science books was equivalent to Albert Einstein's influence on physics. Psychoanalysis explains that we have desires which are out of our mental control. They are hidden in our subconscious and influence our decisions and moreover sometimes even control us. The Burning Books event caused waves of migration from Europe to the United States of America, or how it was called by Freud, Dollarland. Migration consisted of different types of intellectuals and political thinkers, and among them was an Austrian 27-year-old P. 
PhD in psychology, Ernest Dichter. In Austria, he started his own medical practice and opened a clinic on the street on which Sigmund Freud lived. They were colleagues in their field and neighbors on the street. Escaping from the growing Nazi influence, Herr Dichter also moved to the Dollarland. He believed that sex wasn't taboo anymore. People can discuss it and think about it. But we have another strong taboo. It was money. He said, people can't spend money with joy and pleasure. Ernest Dichter decided to change that by making people buy more and more without any inner guilt. He witnessed hyperinflation in Europe and saw how people took the money and tried to spend it as fast as possible because tomorrow they could not buy anything. He understood very clearly what are the forces behind consumer behavior. If we want to sell, we must wake up those forces to motivate people. He had his personal job experience when he worked at the factory which produced paper labels for different products. At that time, he did his main discovery. Sales aren't connected with customers' desires, but they are connected with the ability of the seller to motivate the buying process. Roughly speaking, we don't buy what we need, but what we think we need. And any seller wants to force us to buy their product. In the USA, Ernest Dichter opened a consulting service and described himself as a young psychologist from Vienna with some interesting new ideas which can help you to be more successful, effective, sell more and communicate better. He was the first to suggest that every product has something like a personality, or what we call it now, brand image. In the mind of any customer, images create an analogy with sex. We are not buying a product, we are buying an expansion for our soul. For example, soap and washing of a body were connected through self-feeling sexual experience. By using this idea, he changed the sales of the brand Ivory Soap by making the design of the package more sensual and feminine with smooth elements. You sell not only a soap, but an intimate experience. As a result, all body products were changed forever. For example, remember the advertising of the Axe Effect deodorant. For Ernest Dichter, cars were also gender-type sexual objects. A sedan was a wife and a cabriolet was a love affair. He proposed Chrysler to promote auto salons with cabriolets to attract men with an easy sex association. But as a result, it will help to sell sedans because it will resemble a wife association. Louis Cheskin, a person who is responsible for the creation of the Marlboro man's image, said with great respect above Ernest Dichter that he is a person who sees a force of libido everywhere. A cigarette was a nipple of the great breast of the world, and Marlboro Man was created with the image of a strong cowboy on the horse with a pack of Marlboro in his chest pocket. It is not a coincidence that a pack's design reminds of a metal. It is a cigarette for a real man. Ernest Dichter changed the design of the Barbie doll by making its plastic breasts bigger because each girl wants to be associated with a sexually desired object. When girls grew up and if they had saved Barbie's image in their minds, they try to change themselves into a doll with fashion and plastic surgery. And then Ernest Dichter appeared in the food industry. He said that food also has sex preference. Rice Krispies for women and Wheaties for men. Rice was feminine, the potato was masculine. Tea was feminine, but coffee was ultra-masculine. Two extremes were cake and meat. The peak of feminine and masculine. Some products were bisexual, like fried chicken and orange. After decades, these theories still sound strange and original. It is strange, but it worked very well. And the Frito-Lay company, which produced different types of chips like Doritos and Lay's, decided to hire Herr Dichter. As a result of his work, Creative Memo and Lay's products was produced. He explained that one simple reason why chips were not selling as well as they could was that while people like and enjoy potato chips, they feel guilty about liking them. There is so much fear about the consequences of eating them. Unconsciously, people expect to be punished for letting themselves go and enjoying themselves. He then quoted a consumer who explained, I love them, but I don't like to have them around, as they're so fattening. You can't stop eating them once you start. Dichter counted up seven fears and resistances. You can't stop eating them. They're fattening. They're not good for you. They're greasy and messy to eat. They're too expensive. It's hard to store the leftovers. And they're bad for children. 
Ernest Dichter suggested different tactics and solutions for this problem. Later, it was implemented to the whole food industry. Frito-Lay should avoid using the word fried in referring to its chips and instead adopt the term toasted. We still have this approach in Lay's advertising, where we see happy people eating and we can't see any image of chips production. For fear of letting oneself go, Dichter suggested repacking the chips into smaller bags. The more anxious consumers, the ones who have the deepest fears about their capacity to control their appetite, will tend to sense the function of the new pack and select it. The modern incarnation of this advice will be Lay's advertising only in a woman's world. When we found that women were increasingly avoiding the chip aisle, which our company dominates, we faced a serious challenge. While women snack more than men. They weren't snacking as much anymore with Frito-Lay. So the company refocused advertising to promote healthier sounding versions of its chips, including baked Lay's and the smaller packs that contained only 100 calories each. For dieters, these 100 calorie packs, widely used by food manufacturers, have a major drawback. Recent research has shown they do not work. People who tend to eat compulsively simply go from one little bag to the next. Finally, and perhaps most significantly, Dichter advised Frito-Lay to move its chips out of the realm of between meal snacking altogether and instead turn them into an ever-present item in the American diet. The increased use of potato chips and other Lay's products as part of the regular fare served by restaurants and sandwich bars should be encouraged in a concentrated way, Dichter said, citing a string of examples. Potato chips with soup with fruit or vegetable juice appetizers. Potato chips served as a vegetable on the main dish. Potato chips with salad. Potato chips with egg dishes for breakfast. Potato chips with sandwich orders. Chips were eaten alone, as a snack, and as Dichter pointed out, with a growing sense of guilt. Today, Frito-Lay is not only marketing the chips to restaurants. Taking a cue from the dairy and beef industry, Frito-Lay is promoting its snacks for creative uses at home as ingredients in other foods. Its website has a battery of recipes. It also has an online cookbook entitled Tastes from Home with Frito-Lay. The recipes range from corn chowder made with potato chips to Frito chili pie to Frito's ranch chicken delight. To conclude, Herr Ernest Dichter succeeded to persuade us to take the first bite. Siren's song was sung through radio, TV and the internet. But we didn't know what we were listening to, and we didn't block our ears with wax as Alice's did to survive. We are going to eat food, enjoy food, and with all our effort, ignore the simple and obvious fact that we are doing harm to ourselves. Just to understand what happened to us, this lady in the previous century was considered so fat and grotesque that she participated in a circus freak show. I think we can all agree that in the 21st century, she doesn't look like anything out of the ordinary. Now you know how food alchemy was created. Fat, sugar and salt are crucial elements. But to start to work together, they need one more strong component, persuasion, which was provided by applied psychology. It was the last element which changed our life and our society. The trickiest part is that we need fat, salt and sugar to live healthy and we can't live without them. Poison is in everything, and no thing is without poison. The dosage makes it either a poison or a remedy. Paracelsus, physician, alchemist, laziologian, and philosopher of the German Renaissance.